you have no control over what someone's going to play it up against. As long as the song is in a generally good area and it sounds good to you and to the artist and the producer, and I've kept what they love about the song and maybe developed it a little more, that's the realness of it. That's what I like doing and that's what's best for the song, best for everybody. The up against part can make you change something that doesn't really benefit the song, but it benefits the up against part. Hey there, welcome to the penultimate episode of season six here on The Record Process. We're almost to the end of this chapter on the show, so we thought it might be appropriate to feature our conversation with a guy who knows a thing or two about finishing records. Today, we have our interview with world-class Grammy Award-winning mastering engineer, Chris Geringer. Chris has worked with countless A-list artists and major label superstars throughout his career, but he's joined us here on The Record Process to shine some light on his creative philosophy by describing the specific work he's done recently with Lil Nas X, Rosalie, and 21 Pilots. He talks about creating cohesion in an album and how mindsets can often really differ between producers and mastering engineers. Chris weighs in on the infamous loudness wars and why he believes that the best engineers and artists are always the ones who are open to the opinions of others. Chris shares a ton of his knowledge and insights about making timeless records sound great, and it's all coming up right now. So let's say you've just finished the latest round of mix revisions or the last few tracks on a production you've been working on, but you want instant feedback before you go and ship them out. That's where Audio Mover steps in. Their revolutionary technology allows you to stream high quality audio in real time, making remote collaboration a breeze. And with Audio Mover's Listen To plugin, there's no need for complicated setups or endless file sharing. Simply stream your audio directly from your favorite DAW to anyone, anywhere in the world in real time. And now with their newest plugin, they've made it possible to apply binaural rendering to Dolby Atmos mixes, allowing you to monitor how the spatial audio will sound on Apple Music. Through innovations like this, Audio Movers is leading a revolution in web-based audio transmission and reimagining the way musicians, podcasters, and educators engage with the world around them. So check them out at audiomovers.com and start your free trial today. One of the toughest hurdles for musicians and producers to overcome is recognizing when it's time to let your music go. So stop letting your music sit there on a hard drive waiting for the perfect label scenario to show up. Let DistroKid help you start reaching the fans you deserve right now. There's a reason why DistroKid is the go-to platform for independent musicians across all genres, and it's because they offer seamless and affordable solutions to distribute your music worldwide. Get your tracks on all the most popular streaming platforms like Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon, and so many more in just a few steps. Time is often money, and DistroKid understands that. So they've eliminated long wait times for processing your music in the system. And in fact, they can get your music live in as little as 24 to 48 hours now. The simplicity of the platform and features like automatic revenue splits and YouTube content IDs make distributing your music and collecting payments incredibly simple. DistroKid does not take a percentage of your royalties, and for one low annual fee, you keep 100% of what you own. It's straightforward, transparent, and affordable. So follow the link in our show notes to get 30% off your new DistroKid membership and start letting your music work for you. If you're a solo musician, a singer, a songwriter, or part of a band, you know that the journey does not end once you have that finished master in hand. Building a lasting career around your music requires a lot of additional activities to do things like develop, promote, and ultimately monetize your creative vision. And for those of us that aren't quite doing Taylor Swift level numbers yet, it helps to have a merchandising partner that can meet you where you're at right now. And Smart Punk MFG is a perfect solution for any and all merch manufacturing needs your band might have. From the first note to the final stitch, they have it all covered with whatever you might need. They do screen printing, they do embroidery, stickers, vinyl and CD production, posters, and pretty much everything else under the sun. 
They are an incredibly comprehensive online merch solution, offering reasonable prices and feasible quantities for bands of all sizes. So go check out some samples of what they can do at smartpunkmfg.com. And when you're ready, just shoot them an email at info at smartpunkmfg.com and mention the record process to get 10% off your first order. So remember, that's smartpunkmfg, and it's where creativity meets manufacturing excellence. Chris Geringer, welcome to the record process for anybody listening in Europe. Chris Geringer, um, <laughs> as we've just been talking about name pronunciations. We are very excited to have you, my friend. Thank you for joining us for a conversation about a couple of records that you've mastered that are, well, let's put it this way. A couple people listen to them, uh, to say the yeah, least. Yeah, one, two. One, one, two. one two, maybe three three um uh, in the millions uh yeah. to be fairly stated but thank you for joining us how are you how uh are you coming to us from sterling sound right now i'm in the studio right now thanks for having me first of all well it sounds great it sounds <laughs> phenomenal i can tell i can tell it's i'm mastering my own voice right now mm -hmm. so. great great cool running it through some side chain stuff <laughs> well thanks for having me i'm in yeah. the studio right now i'm always here Brilliant. We wanted to actually do a double header today because – Maybe for, even a triple header. Perhaps even a – honestly, we'll see. There's notes of an impending rain delay. I don't know. We'll see how much time. But we're going to do our damnedest because as a mastering engineer and as a world class one at that, Chris, you do – a lot of records, right? Far more than any artist, producer, or even mixing engineer that we ever talked to, right? And that's the nature of being a professional mastering engineer, right? Yeah, the nature of mastering is, you know, like when you're recording and mixing, recording can take months, you know, I mean, maybe not every single day, 24, you know, 12 hours a day, but it can take a long time to record. And then mixing can take weeks, a month, whatever, you know, all that time. Mastering is usually in modern day mastering, it's usually wrapped up in a couple days, a day, you know, where like years ago when it was cutting vinyl and other things, it might have taken like a few days or a week to master an album with clients coming in. But now everybody just, you know, sends me the files, they load them to my server, I put it all together, I master it in a day or two. Yeah, you have a you have a you have a pretty well refined system and process that makes because I mean, well, time is money in a sense, but obviously it goes beyond that in allowing you to do your best work in a short amount of time to make movements that really count and um, and that's that's why that's why people call on you and and everybody over there. For those that don't know, we'll obviously link out to Sterling Sound. There's a there's an incredibly rich history there and a lot of really talented ears. And and people that you work side by side every day, right? Doing a lot of really incredible records. And unfortunately, maybe some not so incredible records. That's also the nature of the beast. Uh, but uh, we are here to talk about two specifically. And the first one of those was a record that, yes, did come out in 2021, even though uh, the making of it and when it came across your desk uh, may not have necessarily been in that exact time frame as we were talking about, because sometimes you finish these things and they don't come out for, for a long time, you know? Yeah. But the first record is Montero by Lil Nas X and was, I mean... <laughs> There's a lot that you can say about this. I'm sure the Wikipedia page for those that would like to read fully into the deep depths of the history in Lil Nas X as an artist and his origin story. It's rich. There's a, there's a lot out there. So we won't, you know, we won't go too deep into that because we want to talk about the process of you getting this record and helping that team and everybody he had bring this to life be finished, right? Because you were you were the finisher, essentially. You were that last, if it's a relay race, you were the guy that brings this record across that finish line. In a modern day description, mastering is like Photoshop for music. You mm -hmm. know, so like you do a photo shoot, they take pictures, you have set dressers, you have all, you know, fashion, all this stuff. And then it all goes in for editing and cleanup. And that's what I basically do. I love that. So talk to us about how this came across your desk, the metaphorical desk, right? It, you know, even today, there's not really consoles anymore. Like everything's, you know, an audio workstation. So it's just, you know, it's a keyboard and a screen and, you know, maybe some volume control stuff and, you know, things like that. How it came to be that this was floated into your or uploaded to your server to be finished by you. <laughs> yeah. So it kind of goes back a couple of years to take a day trip when they were, the producers 
when they were not really take a day trip and they were just starting out as NYU students. And I have some friends that know them and they came to me for some like low budget work. And, uh, you know, they were just starting out and I kind of helped them out. And, you know, we started doing more and more records together. And then, you know, they kind of really took off. I mean, they went from unknown to, you know, Little Nas X producers overnight. They continued to bring me the work and they brought it in and it was my project to go with. I love loyalty in the business. It's hard to find sometimes, but those guys, you know, they stayed loyal and it's nice. So yeah, they sent me the record. It came in very slow in the beginning, like one song, you know, one week, another song, another week. And then as the, you know, the process and the, and the popularity of the single started growing, more songs came in and you know, they went, they also had different mixers, different engineers, different writers, different everything. So it kind of is this, you know, broad spectrum process, you know, like if it was one studio, one mix engineer, it would be a little more linear. But the fact that it was all these different people, different timelines, it kind of comes in and, you know, it doesn't make sense at first as far as mastering goes. You know, I kind of like want everything to have like a vibe, the same vibe or like, you know, if you're traveling in and out of the vibe between the songs, it makes some sense still. My point was to kind of clean up each individual track, but keep it its own thing and then, you know, make it flow with the other stuff. So, Chris, like, is there a a way that you found to refocus between the that like between like the shaping of each track before like uh, going into the, like making it work as a cohesive unit yeah, together. So each, when each mixer and producer or whoever, you know, whatever the other people in the team, every time they send me a song that's, you know, varied over an album, each one of them, their vision is their song sounds the best. So I have to do that to their song. I have to make their song sound really big and the way they want it. And then they're fine with that until... I look at look at the whole thing as a as a whole instead of individual songs. Everybody else kind of looks at it as, you know, their individual projects and I have to look at it as a unified the whole movie instead of one scene. So I'm responsible for kind of gluing it together and keeping the other guys happy about their pieces, you know? Of course. That was the, the first challenge that I was going to kind of dig into because, so you mentioned this kind of, you were not delivered all of the songs on the record in one folder at once, correct? No. That is one of the big differences from a lot of people that are coming from the world of rock and bands, like the world of pop, and especially nowadays with the way songs are released and very quickly, is coming to people like yourself in a very different way. Yeah. I mean, when I started in the business, everything was, you know, albums were delivered as albums. They came together on reel-to-reel -reel tapes. You know, there was an A-side and a B-side reel. You could play the whole thing and it was sequenced basically, or you would tighten it up in the studio. It made sense as an album for the most part, because when the guys were mixing, they were listening to the other things and they wanted to know what was going on. And there weren't so many cooks in the kitchen. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And yeah. now today, like, it doesn't matter because each song can be its own thing. And, you know, a lot of pop artists, you know, they get their songs from different producers. So it doesn't have to be one person that they sit in a studio with. It can be 10 people and they can have 10 completely different songs by, you know, 10 different production styles and instrumentation and just vibe. Everything can be different. So when I get it, it's more of a challenge today to put it together i mean sometimes i feel like people don't care anymore like the 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 i'm an old guy now so the younger generation likes everything kind of like you know they're like oh i love this song and i don't care about the album or now i like this song but i still don't care about the album you know when i started in the business everybody listened to an album because that's what it was you had to go out and buy an album or you bought a 45 record and you listen to the single or you listen to the album you know, and for the most part, you would try and listen to the whole album to see what it was about, you know, see if there were any other songs on there. You know, today with, you know, streaming media, you can click through an album in, you know, one minute and decide how much of it you like or you don't. Of course. So I, you know, I have to like try and make the whole thing likable, I guess. <laughs> right, right. Well, and, you're, and, it, and it's The tough weight of too. the world. <laughs> yeah, because you feel like, or I guess that maybe the phrase it as a question instead, you know, like you having a relationship with, you work with a lot of the same producers. They, they know and trust your ear and trust you with their, you know, 
final mixes, right? So in this case, do you, you know, with an art, is it artist dependent where does that, you know, does that affect and how did that specifically affect maybe your initial process in pushing these out as just single focus tracks at first without seeing a full cohesive vision, but knowing that they were, you know, in the land, the modern landscape, these are going to be up against a ton of other different pop songs in the, in the hip hop and, you know, um, and pop world on DSPs, uh, you know, not just once upon a time, it might've been like a terrestrial radio station was as grouped as they would get. But in this case, do you take into consideration and at the, even at the producers, you know, note, do you, or look at the artists and say, this is the world they run in. This is what's, what it's going to be up against, or is it just trying to do the best by the song? What do you think? I try try and do the best by the song every single yeah. time like that's my only thought process the up against thing and i'm glad you said it that way because that's verbiage that i still don't understand like mm. there's music is not a competition and everybody everybody uses up against when they tell me what their notes about the song is right. i played it up against this song and i felt that and i played it up against this song and i felt that and it's kind of like you have no control over what someone's going to play it up against so mm -hmm. as long as the song is in a generally good area and it sounds good to you and to the artist and the producer and i've kept what they love about the song and maybe developed it a little more that's the realness of it that's what i like doing and that's what's best for the song best for everybody the up against part can make you change something that doesn't really benefit the song but it benefits the up against part you know like right. if it's brighter it'll sound like so and so's record if it's louder it'll sound like somebody else's record and the whole thing about the levels and playing them you know on a streaming platform where some people say, oh, my! I don't feel my record's loud enough. And it's like, so there's a volume control and it rotates <laughs> and it gets louder and lower. It's like the heat and air conditioning in your house. It's like the speed of a car. It's like everything. You control it by a knob or something that regulates the speed or the level or something. And people just, they feel like when they're listening to music, they cannot touch the volume. Like mm -hmm. if it's not louder or if it's lower, it's not good. Now, what if it's too loud? Because yeah. I worked with an artist, I can't say who it is, and I'm driving in my car on Saturday morning listening to New Music Friday, and four or five songs in, and this song that I did comes on. I had to jump for the volume control to turn it down because it was so loud and so like just, it was like, you know, I'm cruising, you know, just vibing along. And all of a sudden this song comes on and it's screaming loud and I had to turn it down. And I'm sure if I had to turn it down, a lot of other people had to turn it down. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the part that I don't get. It's okay to turn it down, but it's not okay to turn it up. Like what sense does that? Yeah. Like it, it goes to the it, one, there's two things that I, I think come up from that is like the overall intent of the artist and the intent of like what the song is like, you're not going to have an ambient track as loud as like a pop track. That would be crazy. Never. Never. But on the flip side, when using that, uh, like, uh, like the, the loudness aspect, I, I, I would be curious if like you also find that intentful as well. So like if, if someone asks you to crank it up, but like gives you a reasoning behind it. Be like, I want it to sound like it's breaking. That I completely understand the crunchiness or the, the harshness that they want to, you know, they want to put in the song to give a feeling or a vibe, but just basic volume. Like that's something that doesn't like, I try and rationalize it with clients sometimes and they just literally go, okay, turn it up. You know, like <laughs> I do this whole you know, thing. And it's just like, okay, turn it up. And it's like, okay, you know, I'm not winning in a lot of cases with this. The times where I really try and talk a client down in that, in the pushing the level is when I feel like the dynamics of the record have disappeared. Like the magic, the movement of the bass, the movement of the drums, you know, the spatial aspect where dynamics take, take place. When that's gone, I feel like then I have to really push the client to like, just leave the volume where it is. Yeah, of course. There are some clients have been coming in who 
don't want it pushed. They're like, I really want to keep the dynamics. That's my vibe. That's the whole thing. And it's great then because then I can kind of just do my thing and really get it to sound good and not worry about like, oh, what are they going to say? Even though like a month later, they'll be like, oh, it's just not loud enough. (laughs) Yeah. So talk to us, uh, you know, and obviously that, you know, you do it like we said, you do a lot of records. So it's very hard to remember the nuance and specific things. Were there any tracks from this record, Montero, that came in as they came in that you distinctly remember either having to take a beat to get it a handle around or get creative or having to work hand in hand with like maybe some specific requests from any of the producers or mix engineers along the way? Most of the requests were from the label. You know, there was mm. a couple of people at the label who wanted to make comments about the record and that's fine. But I always find that like a, like a little bit of a tricky place because the producer and the mixer is kind of like, why did you do that? And I'm like, well, someone at the label wanted it that way. And it's like, okay, you know, yeah. they want me to now call them back and tell them to shut up, you know, like, st- right. stay, you know, whatever. So it's just a weird place. But for the most part, like an album like Montero or any of the really big albums that I work on, the mixes are generally better than average. Not always amazing, but better than average because they've spent so much time. The guys working on them, like, are just, you know, top of the you know top of the food chain mixers and it really makes my job easier you know that being said every now and then i got to get into maybe one or two tracks that need like a lot of work or maybe a little more work than i had imagined but for the most part on you know this is like the this is like behind the curtain kind of thing like people always ask me like oh when you do this really big record like is it really hard and i'm like no the you know the better the production the better the mixing the easier the job and yeah. that's something like it's I got lucky. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. you know, that that's the best part about my job is not having to do a lot of work and really be able to like dial in a couple nice parts of a record and, and get it going. It's when, you know, I have 25 artists, unsigned artists who hear Montero and say, Oh, I want you to do that to my album. And they didn't have the same guys mixing and they didn't work in the <laughs> studio and they didn't have the production team writing the songs. And, You know, they're just assimilating themselves to Monte, you know, to little Nas because they think they want to be as successful as him or whatever. And I have to like kind of like do some heavy duty, like, you know, strong handed work to their stuff to even get it close to that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's such a great point is it's a sum of everything that kind of came before it, you know, so it's not the job of mastering and as talented as you might be to try and undo or do things to a song that were not done there, you know, so it's, it, that's a, that's a great indicator is, you know, your only, your work is, you know, it gets better exponentially because of where it starts off at. So I, I have one question uh, would be if there are any of these, maybe instead of specific, you know, there's always a lot of voices in the room, especially at the final, you know, at the final sprint, right? Because when people are getting nervous, they're like, this is it, right? You know, like this is like when they're starting to get the versions that like are going to be signed off on to go out to the world, like there's no more, okay, cool, this will get fixed or there's no more whatever. So that's, yeah that you know understandably i think that's when artists can tend to get nervous or maybe even a label who a lot of people on the hook putting a lot of money into something right you know understandably that's that's where a lot of opinions come into play and that job in and of itself is probably really difficult to navigate right trying to do all that as you described and i'm sure yeah a record like this is probably no different especially when there's i'm looking at the wikipedia page i mean it's just completely littered with like mega stars you know between features and people that have mixed you know the producers obviously like so Talk to me about then if you know that there's so many people at, you know, large labels, let, let's say with a record like this, where you already know this is going to go, that this is going to be heard by a lot of people, right? You know, um, and that a lot of people are going to be listening to your work. I'm curious how, and obviously the, this comes with confidence a little bit, but how do you get in the right frame of mind to not overthink yourself, right? Because it, just like you said, people are like, hey, aren't you nervous? Like, aren't you worried? Like, what, you know, um, And I kind of, I still wonder the same thing, even though I, you know, I I kind of get how that might go and build over time. What kind of mindset do you put yourself in when you get a record like this? Because you get a lot of them to make sure that you're not overthinking something. Or if a track does come across your desk that doesn't need a ton of lifting, that you don't feel inclined to work on it a little bit longer because you know millions of people are going to listen to it instantly. For me, it came with time is like actually 
believing my own shit, believing that my work is good. And, you know, in the beginning, you don't want to sound like just, you know, big headed and whatever, like, oh, you know, I tell people like I do classes every now and then for younger kids and stuff. And I'm like, you really have to tell yourself that you're the best. You have to. You can't go through the music business or, or any form of art and say, I'm just OK. You literally have to convince yourself what you do is special and that you're the best at it. And you have to sell that every day. But the reality of it is when you're working, you're not that confident. You're like, oh my God, Little Nas X album, this is going to be big. Is this song right? Am I doing this right? Is somebody going to make it sound better than me? Like I, you know, like you get all in your head, but at some point you have to say, okay, it really sounds right. And for me, it's when I listen to it like a day later, Mm -hmm. like when I work on a project, if I get one, like we were saying, if I get one song at a time over months, it's the worst because as I go through the, the timeline, I keep going back to the other songs and wishing I could remaster those or do something. But if they're released or whatever, I can't do it. And if somebody else said, oh, my God, I love that song, I can't go back and change it. So it's very hard to like for me a lot of times to, to listen to something and be able to stand behind it later on in the process. If I do a whole album at once, I really feel like, OK, that's the whole album I really got into the whole thing. I shaped it the way I wanted to, and everything is more linear and and more together. When I go through those other songs, I'm constantly going back and being like, man, I shouldn't have made that song that loud. I shouldn't Mm -hmm. have done this. I shouldn't have done that. I really should have done this. And and I do, I mean, at this point in my career, I still like second guess myself when I'm put in that situation. But I think that's also like natural that, you know, I don't think you should ever feel that confident that like, oh, I did that and that shit sounds great. And, you know, I don't have to think about it or touch it again. I'm always checking myself. I check myself every single day I walk in this room and I listen to something. I'm like, okay, this is this right? Maybe I should listen to this record and compare it. You know, people always give me references. Like it's funny when people give me references of artists, it's always big stars. Nobody ever gives me this really weird record that was done in the eighties that nobody ever heard of. And they're like, this is my vibe. You know, people are like, Oh, make me sound like little Nas X or Rihanna or Lady Gaga or, you know, one Republic like that. It's all these references and they're all the references really attached to something greater. The references right. mm-hmm. attached to success and, you know, charts and, you know, all this stuff. So, when I listen to a reference or something that puts me in that line, I also have to think about like, okay, that's what they say they want, but they're not even, their music's not even like that. So then I have to go do this now. And I, and I get in this whole weird place when I'm, when I'm doing that sometimes, like, I'm like, where do, where do I call, you know, where do I call the whole thing and put it in in this space? Yeah. In that specific scenario, you're now the, like trying to define their intent both artistically yeah. and commercially, which is crazy to put that weight on your shoulders. But like, that's why you are at the level that you're at. People in reality, compared to mixing and recording, mastering is like a, a second in time, but it's the last second. So, you know, it's like counting down from 10, you know, like when you're watching a countdown of a rocket ship, when they're at eight, you're like, yeah, whatever. When they're at two, you're like, you know, oh my god <laughs> and that, and that's, where, that's where i am you know i'm at yeah. one <laughs> so yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. it's interesting because it is it is a matter of language communication and ultimately intent right so i'm not sure like did you at all work directly or do you typically i'm sure you do obviously but when you're working with an artist directly you know sometimes it's the producers that will that will pass along the masters sometimes it's the mixing engineer whatever it is and sometimes it's just the artist that has gone out and is you know is championing everything and is sending them to you how do you gauge understanding where to tap in because it's it's sometimes you know predicated on what the ask is and who's asking and what their vocabulary is you know always yeah. and what's funny is like i judge artists by our contact in the end like Rosalia, if you were just going to look at her as an artist, I don't think most people would even kind of like put out there that, you know, she's really savvy in the studio. She listens to everything super critically. Like you just don't like most people wouldn't guess that about an artist. Rosalia is so connected and so in tune with her music and everything that's done to it. Like it warms my heart when like I speak to someone like that and they're like, I love what you did here, but can we try and notch this and do this and whatever? Then I'm like, oh wow, somebody's actually listening to what I'm doing. It's a conversation. 
Right. Yeah. Some there's conversation, there's communication, mm-hmm. there's everything that you said and vibe and all that stuff. And now I really feel connected to the artist and to the music more. You know, like you said before, I take direction from mixers a lot of times because they send me the tracks and the mixers are like, I want Chris to do it. Or the producer will have a mixer do it and then say, I want Chris to do it. And then there's a different set of notes and a different kind of right. the way I look at it. And then there's the artist who says, OK, I want Chris to do it. And they don't care what the producer or whatever. They want me to do it because of, of another reason. And right, then right. I have to like go into that whole thing. You know, and some, like like I said, with Rosalia, some artists are really basically a mixer, an engineer, a producer, and, you know, an artist at the same time. And I find that amazing when I get that. There are a lot of artists out there that are like that. And it's fun to work with them because you really, you're really like, you're connecting at, you know, on an equal level of, you know, what they want. It's not being yeah. filtered through someone else. It's directly with them. They completely understand what they're saying and what they're doing. And it just makes the whole process like fun and accurate. I love that so much. And it must, it feels great to know that they are engaged truly until the end and caring so much. Cause I think a lot of times you think, you know, we think we care and we do care, but there's only to a point of what we know and can recognize right within the, within the artistry and it gets very granular and i'm curious a lot of times too we talk about the process uh, at large of making albums you know in a linear fashion right first you write then you record then you you know then you mix then you master are there moments, especially because you develop a relationship that is very unique to that process, right? Because you are the finishing, you know, point. Are there times where someone gets to, and there obviously are, where someone gets to the end and then you turn around and say, hey, here's what I'm, you know, what I, my intuition says, but it's tough for me to do that. Let's tag team and and find get to the finish line a different way, whether that be going to the mixing engineer and saying, hey, I love this. I, I kind of want to, you know, want to push this element a little harder or X, Y and Z, you know, but it might be tough. Right. Sometimes, you know, vocal up, vocal down mixes are, are a, a big, you know, a common thing in, in the pop world. Can you speak to that, especially, or maybe the relationships that you have with producers or mix engineers and even just being curious and being excited and be like, whoa, what, like, what did you use here or here? This sounds great. You know, like maybe you're like, I don't even have to touch this. This, I, I just want to know what he did. You know, what was on his, like mix bus. To me, the best engineers, the best producers, the best artists are always open to opinion Mm -hmm. in the circle of people that they're working with. And I mean, there are some, you know, some of the biggest producers in the world I work with that are like, if there's anything you need, let me know. And I kind of feel like, okay, this is going to be good because I can literally say this track is too muddy. This track, you know, the drums are too loud or whatever. Some mixers, Serban Genna, he's one of the biggest mixers in the world. And every time he sends a mix, he's like, let me know if it's okay. You know, he literally (laughs) says, is it good? And I mean, this is a guy who you basically do nothing. Mastering for Serban is almost flat every time. Like you might add it, you know, a touch of top end, maybe push the vocals in the middle. Like you're just touching it. You're, you know, it's like, yeah. you know, like yep. that's, that's what you do with his stuff. He's constantly saying, let me know if you need anything. Let me know if the vocals are too loud. Let me know if the, should I bring it down? Is it too, is it whatever? And it's like, this is the biggest guy asking me to tell him if it's okay yeah. or if he <laughs> need to change. And then I deal with some people who are like, you know, they're like, I'm like, do you think you could like send me another pass, like three dB lower? Because I feel it's distorting. Three dB lower. I, I what? Uh, you know, and it's like I, you know, like it's distorting. Can you turn it down? So it's it's a weird place asking people for stuff. Sometimes I just did a session a couple of days ago where I asked somebody to revisit their mix and try something different and. They were kind of open to it, but I felt like, you know, like they kind of thought I was judging them when I'm not judging them. I'm trying to get them to the finish line. Their concern was they wanted to sound like all the other stuff I do, the big records. And I'm like, okay, here's what we need to do. And they were like, oh, you know, and it's like, you asked me, I'm telling you, but you know, if you go to a doctor and he's like, oh, you know, you need to have that thing removed. And you're like, hmm, whatever, you know, yeah, you know, it's like (laughs) you went to a doctor, you asked him to look at something he said to do this and now you're like you know so it's like not like i'm a doctor but i feel like you guys came to me you hired me 
I wasn't like standing on your front steps, ringing your doorbell going, do you need mastering? You know, they asked me what I think and I told them and now they get like a little, you know, weird about it. Yeah. yeah. Also your personality and the way you engage with your clients, uh, you know, especially especially too when you were talking about big time records like this little Nas X record and maybe the, you know the other two that you know we might jump into it's okay if someone hears something back and doesn't dig it to also realize it's like hey maybe it's maybe the issue actually isn't just the master you know maybe the master brought out something about the mix that I didn't catch before this has happened with me where I've gotten ma masters back and I'm like can I send you a, a revision mix real quick. You know what I mean? Like, and then we talk yeah. through it and like, what is it? And be like, well, it's this, but it's this thing that like I missed here, but now like you push the vocals in the middle and now I hear it a bit more, but I like that, but I want to, you know, those kind of things. So I, I just wanted to make that point that it's not always a, once it gets to you, that's it. It's only you that there is a way where it's still a team effort, you know, oh, yeah. um, if people allow it to be, regardless of how big time the record is. That was a great example example how it doesn't matter if you're one of the best mixers in the world like you get that way by still being like hey let me know if it's good if you have any yeah. notes yeah. Get, let me know <laughs> which i love it doesn't matter what level in the music business you are if you're not studio savvy or you don't really understand the process a lot of people don't really understand what mastering is you know mm -hmm. i get every now and then my manager will you know she fields all my calls and all my emails and everything and she finds herself a lot of times explaining like chris just mastered the record he didn't you know, produce anything. He didn't, you know, he wasn't in the studio when they were doing this. He's just like cleaning it up and making it sound better. And people are like, you know, I really, the strings don't sound right. And they, you know, they're still talking about mixing in the mastering stage. So it's kind of like, you know, there's a little bit of education involved with, you know, with new clients or people who are just, you know, starting out in the music business yeah. and that's fine but you know there there, there is a lot of there's a lot of time where i'm trying to you know where i'm educating a client and really trying to bring them into the you know into the fold of what what i do and how i do it and what what my limitations are what i can do for them if you're listening to this show i'm guessing there's a good chance that you're the type of person that appreciates the time and effort that goes into something meaningful something lasting and something that tells the world exactly who you are well brett and dave the co-founders of our sponsor oxford pennant share that very same appreciation they've made it easier than ever to elevate any space in your life and express your style with their meticulously crafted american-made pennants from classic designs to customized creations each piece is a work of art it's quality you can feel and a statement that truly lasts a lifetime I recently had the pleasure of touring their Buffalo-based shop where they tirelessly make each piece by hand. And honestly, their process really is an inspiring fusion of passion and precision. So go make your mark, celebrate your story, and discover the epitome of timeless craftsmanship and personalized expression by visiting OxfordPennant.com today. Uh, you brought up some really cool stuff on that Rosalia record, the Motomami record. Comparatively to the Lil Nas X record, how did that come in? How was that process same or different? It was kind of the same thing. You know, like a couple singles came in, then we, then we started getting hit with all the album tracks. And, you know, it's like kind of like hurry up and go. You know, this record's going to be huge. You know, both albums were major albums. Rosalia won Album of the Year, Latin Grammy, and Best Engineered. Little Nas X was nominated for Album of the Year and the regular Grammys, whatever the Grammys mean. Um, but the recognition was there for both albums as two of the, you know, two of the bigger albums for each year. That whole process was basically the same. You know, like I'm dealing with big producers, big artists. You know, mm -hmm. thankfully, you know, with Little Nas X, you know, take a day trip guys and I have some history and you know we speak directly and then for rosalie and noah goldstein who i've have a long history with he was in charge of that and i kind of just deal with him so it's great when i have like you know the shepherds of the flock deal you know kind of keeping everybody in check and you know running it through them so too much insider baseball you know isn't good for anybody but you know what does that process look like too because you you're mentioning it's like it's for you it's about like you're say, you're trying to do the best work and the you know your focus are the songs and the files right but then you know that there are a lot of people that have been involved and in, and in, in like this how does that maybe for people that are used to just okay i send it off to a guy he 
just sends me back a song that kind of sounds louder. That's my, you know, that's my reality. Yeah. You, when you're dealing with it, like you mentioned at this point, at this point with, uh, with Noah Goldstein, right? So what does that, you know, feel like and how are you, you know, kind of maneuvering back and forth, realizing that there's a lot of voices and opinions at, at the very end there for a, a record like that? So if there is somebody in charge like Noah, it's so much easier because I'll get my direction from him or Rosalia. And if it's from him, it's probably, fil- it could be from someone else, a producer, someone else in the group, but it's filtered through him. And he's looking at, he's doing what I'm doing. He's looking at it as a whole and what it needs to make the record. And if it's Rosalia, maybe, you know, not just saying her, she would do the right thing. But with if it's another artist, maybe they're looking for like, something they didn't feel they got in mixing so i could kind of go back and forth with the mixer on that but if it's just like a producer from one track and then a producer from another track and they're like turn my bass up make mine louder do that it's like out of control and i feel like the record's slipping away when it does that when they do that you know or if it's filtered through like a couple people i really feel like the record stays in control and for me honestly i feel like the record comes out better for me the artist the rest of the world may have a different opinion but for me here in the studio i feel like it's a better record when i have someone in control of the, you know, the masses. Yeah. And, and not dealing with everyone's positioning. That's a, that's a lot of like emotional labor on top of the physical labor that you're doing. And so like, I, I, I can't even imagine being in that scenario and like having it feel good in the end. I've literally had producers say, just make my song louder than everybody else's. So oh, they didn't man. care what I did to everybody <laughs> else's. Just make my song louder or yeah. better. It's like you needed to just start a few steps ago if we if you wanted that. <laughs> yeah, but like, what are you doing for the project? If it's right, just, yeah, of course. course, you know what I'm saying. Like, you know, I'm batting ninth, so you know, yeah. what I'm, saying? <laughs> I, I'm batting ninth, so I got to come in and yeah. be like, all right, everybody. <laughs> you know? Totally, totally. What was um in Noah's in that position like? Kind of having someone um refocus all of the the feedback, I guess, um, and filter it down to you. He's one of the best who does that. What was his? I guess what was his official role in in the project then too? Because I think what you're describing too, even in like you know with like smaller bands or rock bands, we always like generally speaking pick one person to be the liaison to be like, okay, collect all of the notes and read them top to bottom and make sure that what we send to a mix engineer, mastering engineer makes sense. And there's not like one note that, you know, three notes down gets canceled out by somebody else's note. I love that because I literally will get notes from a band and it's different when there's one artist, it's a producer or a mixer and the artist, you know, if it's a singer, you know, mm-hmm. like if it's like a, you know, like a Rosalie, I mean, Rosalie is more involved, but if it's like an Ava Max or a Rihanna or someone who's like, you know, this icon star and then has a team of people, I've dealt with Ava Max directly and Rihanna directly. It's different than taking this whole thing down where other people are saying stuff like in a band, you know, the drummer's like, hey, man, I don't feel the groove, you know. The guitar player is like, can you bring up those little spacey things that I'm doing? You know, and the vocalist is always like, you know, my vocals or, you know, whatever. It's almost spinal tappy, you know, like each one is just worried about their thing. So when I have like one person, an executive producer, in a sense, to come Mm -hmm. in and say, you're going to speak to me. I'm going to feed you all the notes. I'll go through everything and weed out the turn the bass up. You know, turn the bass down, turn the vocals up, turn the vocals down. You know, they take all that shit out and they say, okay, this is what, you know, whatever. So much easier. There's times I'm literally sitting here and I'm like, why am I doing this? Like, why (laughs) why didn't I, you know, I should have opened a gardening center, you know, where I'm like, dealing with the notes don't even make, the notes are like three pages long and they don't make sense. And I literally have to like go downstairs and ask my manager, like, can you read them to me? Just so I hear them coming from your voice and not, you know, this crazy voice I have in my head. (laughs) <laughs> Whenever I'm I like I'm mixing a lot of the artists that I'm working with my favorite projects are the projects that like instead of it like books on books of very like detailed notes they're like I don't know maybe turn up the guitar here and like otherwise it's gravy it's all it's all good and yeah. like that it, like I guess where I'm going with that is when it's such a good collaborative process that less is more and they trust your intuition and they know where you're going to go 
and they build that in and bake that into their process. Uh, yeah, I can see how that makes these superstar records. Yeah. yeah. I have clients who like, they literally tell me when they started making the record, like you're going to master it. This is going to be, you know, this is going to be the whole process. I've picked everybody out. I know what you do in the end and I'm fine. And the whole project is it's a piece of cake. You know, like I do it. They're like, I love it. And that's it. It's when I get clients who want me for other records that I've done, but they don't understand the process. They don't understand like no. what the mixer did. They don't un like the mixer isn't working with them anymore. I get a lot of people who, you know, the mixer's done with them by the time it comes to me. Like they're not returning phone calls. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's going to be no revisions. It's done. You know, the, the budget ran out, the time ran out, the, a million things, their patience ran out. So now I'm forced into like being like a kind of like mixer fixer, you know, like I have yeah. to do these <laughs> things and they don't get it. You know, they don't, they just don't get it. I mean, yeah. I literally have clients who don't understand when it comes to me. Like, I get notes for like, can you bring up the backgrounds in this in the bridge? Can you do this in the choruses? Can you, you know, can you change the reverb? And I'm like, no, that's a mix thing, you know. Yeah. And they don't, they just, they just don't know. And then I get other people like, you know, I'll do this crazy amount of work. I'll do all this stuff I might not generally do in a week, you know, like in a weekly span, but I'm mm -hmm. doing it on this project. I'm doing all this work and. They listen to it and they're like, oh my God, you made it, you know, you made it so much better and it's so great. And it's, it's just like, to me, it's like, I don't know what I'm going to get some days, you know? Yeah. yeah. Like, I think I have something really easy and I'm just tweaking it and doing these little things. And they come back with pages and pages mm -hmm. of notes and comments. And like, you change the vibe, you change this. And I'm like, I added like, you know, a DB at 60 Hertz. You know, yeah. like I didn't change, I didn't change the reverb. I didn't change the, I didn't yeah. change the, you know, the keyboard stabs. I didn't yeah. change the symbols. Yeah. I didn't do any of that stuff. And then there's other stuff where I'm literally changing the whole structure of the song, the, the, way, the way the high end is, the way all these different things. And they come back and they're like, cool. Sounds good. You know, it's like, yeah, I did yeah. so much work. Cool. Yeah. You know, like <laughs> now I re I rebuilt the entire like frequency structure of your track. Yeah. Like, oh man. Yeah. Well, and it's true. It's, I mean, it's such a mixed bag because you get so many different types of things from so many different people. The final one that I think, and touching a little bit more on this kind of executive producer role and how helpful that can be in having a liaison it's really like a translator, right? It's kind of yeah. like, it's an interpreter. It's saying, okay, I'm going to take all of your notes here and then maybe not word for word, but I'm going to translate the gist to a person in a different language that I know, you know, in a way I know that they will be able to best understand and internalize the information. And so, and that is really super uh, valuable, obviously, as you've mentioned in a scenario like with that uh, Rosalia record. And I, I wanted to bring up one last record because it, it, it kind of is a, a bit of a different dynamic in that it's, you know, it's a mainstream record, but the 21 Pilots record, Scaled and Icy, uh, that also dropped in 2021, I wonder what the process in comparison to these other two records looked like uh, in terms of who was involved and how you treated it. Let's let's start with this. Did you get the whole record in, a, you know, a kind of all at once or a, the majority of it at once and treat it as such? Or was it still more more towards the, you know, song at a time? So first of all, that record was done. I mean, I did the single as a single and then the project came in as a whole album. Everything was done, but it was done during COVID. So yeah. it was the first attended session I did during COVID. And the A&R guy, this guy, Pete Gambarg at Atlantic Records, I've worked with him forever, for 30 years. You know, we're, we're, we, we used to be neighbors, we're friends. And I was still nervous about him coming in because of COVID. You know, he was nervous about coming in. Everybody was like, oh, you can't come in the studio. And he came in, he wore a mask, I wore a mask, you know. The whole album was basically made remotely by the band because of COVID, you know. But it all came together in one day in my room. I mean, it was over two days, but it all came together. We listened to it as an album. We made it sound like an album. We tied everything together like an album. Was the band there as well? No, the, ba the band was on Zoom calls and phone Got calls. It. And Paul Meany from Mute Math was, you know, one of the collaborators on it. He was on phone calls and Zoom calls. Josh is in L.A., you know. 
everybody else is scattered out the country, Nashville and whatever. So it was kind of weird for them just sending files back and forth. And then when it came to me, it was like, is this thing going to like sound like an album? And it totally did. I mean, you know, everybody involved in that project is a true pro. And I mean, 21 Pilots is one of my favorite bands. I've worked mm. with them from like the beginning. So, you know, it was fun. It was good. But it was interesting, you know, like it was the first attendance session that I did. So it was like, what's going to happen? Like, and I didn't know if it was just Pete coming in. It wound up being, but, you know, just doing Zoom calls, taking notes, playing stuff like, you know, they would, I would send them the file, they would listen to it, and then they would call back and say, okay, do this, you know? Yeah. You know, generally when I have somebody here in the studio, they're hearing it the way I'm hearing it. I let them sit in my chair. They vibe right. the same way. It, it resonates and feels different because I have these giant ATC speakers and, you know, it's a vibe here. It's a total vibe when you're sitting here and you are literally feeling it the way I feel it. So when someone plays it at home, I don't necessarily know what they're using as monitors. I don't know if they're feeling it the same way. I don't know if they're receiving the bass the same way or the mm. imaging the same way. So it's a lot of times it's a concern when I do something and I'm like, oh, my God, that sounds so good. I'm just like sitting in my space listening and be like, what a you know, like it's a sound field. There's all this stuff going on. And then I play it back and they're like, no, nah, I don't feel this. And I'm like, oh, you got to be here. You got to come in. You know? Yeah. So it was just it was a weird thing, like just doing it that way. You know, I mean, it wasn't like because of COVID. It was the first time I did a record like that. But it was the first time I did a record that they wanted to come in and be here and do all this stuff. And we couldn't like the whole record was done in different places because of that, where they would normally get together at some point, and, you know, do things together on that record specifically did anything come up because of the like the isolation of everyone like that came to your desk and you're like oh i need to think a little bit harder about this like this track there were some questions by everybody because they hadn't heard it like mastered and they were mm. curious about what i was going to do and what parts you know were going to come out and everything but what was really odd was the record i thought the record came out so you know, it just sounds so good. It feels so good. You know, I just think it was like, you know, the, I mean, they're great musicians. They're, they're great at everything they do. And, you know, Paul's a great producer and I think he tied it in. And I think everybody just got to spend enough time on it in their own place. And then each one got to sit with it and then kind of like put their part in, tie it together. It really, it came out way better than I thought it was going to come out. You know, there were a lot of other records during COVID that I did that were, chopped up and you know sent all over the world to do things and maybe they didn't sound so good because of that but mm. during that period everybody felt like they needed mastering more than ever because they were questioning what they were hearing in their home studios so the covid period for me was like a very busy and demanding time like for me like i was working almost 12 hours a day through 2020 and 2021 because I was so busy fixing everybody's home studio sound. Oh, wow. like, I wasn't part of that whole like Zoom call, family Zoom calls, you know, making the sourdough bread and the tomatoes and the cheese thing. Like I didn't do any of that stuff. I was, you know, I watched Tiger King, but that was about it. You know, like I was <laughs> here working all the time. Chris, that's an incredible point and way to, I think, kind of wrap all of this up with, with that final thing that you, you kind of led. I was going to ask the question anyway, but because of your setup and how well you know your setup and a lot of other people, you know, that make records at home or, you know, we're making them in, you know, bedroom studios or, you know, modified home studios to varying degrees of, you know, professional quality and spec, right? You were probably, are, are there times and or were there any times on this record that with, with the pilots one specifically, I guess, that you saw where your instinct is to say, well, wait, what you're describing, I'm I'm really not hearing uh, as much. Um, and, and so it makes you question it where to the point where you think that, you know, you you extend a recommendation about perhaps it's your monitoring environment or what are you listening on or things like that to get a better understanding of that communication and what someone might be hearing on the other end based on their revision notes. Oh, yeah. I mean, that was the that was kind of the culture shock during COVID was that all these big artists who normally camp out in a studio for a month or two months making a record could no longer do that. So mm -hmm. they bought, they, you know, they, everybody went online to Sweetwater, you know, bought a whole studio and was like, hey, man, I'm up and running and this shit sounds good here. And it's like, OK, it's your den converted into a studio or your spare bedroom. You have minimal 
treatment in the room. You position your speakers and it sounds pretty good. And you played a couple albums and moved some speakers and said, okay, that sounds really good. But you don't know how it translates to the real world. Having mm -hmm. something sound good in a spot is fine. But if it, what my studio does is my studio translate translates into the rest of the world as sounding good. If your room is not translating, if everything you've done doesn't translate, then you need it to be mastered, maybe remixed and tweaked up. And that's the part that I don't think a lot of people understood then. And I still think a lot of people don't understand now, like newer, newer producers, newer musicians don't understand because you spent 10 grand on an amp and speakers and some stuff doesn't mean it sounds right in your room. It might be good equipment. It might be the, you could spend 25 grand on speakers and put them in your bedroom. and doesn't mean what you've done will sound good on every other system. It might only sound good in your room because of the treatment and the way the, you know, your position in the room, everything like my room is, is tested. You know, I've done all these records in here that, people will say sound good or sound bad whatever your opinion is but it's all you know like it's tested you're literally preaching to the choir tom as yeah. an acoustician how do you feel about what chris has just said Ten thousand <laughs> percent, chris uh I, I was i was installing a studio uh the other week and they had enormous monitors and their room was extremely small but they were they were saying but uh, our buddy uses these monitors. Uh, I, I think uh, they're like the focals, the big like trios. But your room is a closet. Like <laughs> you're not far yeah. enough away to to get the full envelopment of that. I think that that portion of education, for better or for worse, we'll see how it plays out over the course of time. But COVID was definitely a uh, a very enlightening time for a lot of people in in that regard. Yeah. Literally everybody I know. When COVID first hit, I took a bunch of equipment from here and brought mm -hmm. it home and put it in my guest bedroom. One of my sons was living with me at the time, and he's a musician, a producer, an engineer. We set up a studio, and he was using it to write and produce and do stuff and you know do his music. And I was just like checking mixes on it because I was like, uh, I'm not like, it, we didn't do the no driving thing. We didn't do the close the studio thing. We didn't do all this stuff where I didn't have to come in. So I was coming here and I was working normally. I was working in my zone. But when I would listen at home, I was like, man, this is not right. Like, it's not right. You know, and I had, I brought home good equipment. I brought home like some really good speakers and a whole bunch of shit. And it was just like, it's not right. You mm -hmm. know, and it was great for my son writing and doing stuff. Because he would just hear his parts playing through the speakers. But when it came to mixing for him at home, he was like, can, you bring, can we go in the studio and listen to this? And I'd be like, you hear that? That's what it sounds like. Yeah. And at home, it sounds your way and it sounds great. But it's, you know, some whatever he had at the time. He had some NS10s or something and some yeah. other speakers, some barefoots, all these different speakers at home. And it was like, okay, that's cool. But when we get to my studio, it doesn't sound good. You know, that's the, that's the line in the sand is like, does it sound good somewhere else? And if it doesn't sound good here, it's not going to sound good somewhere else. Yeah. Cause almost everyone that will ever listen to your song is not going to listen to it where you're making it. So that is a very good fact. Yeah. Uh, to remember having a home set up with very nice speakers and hi-fi set up in that capacity the intent is for your enjoyment in that time and in that place. It's not for the consumption across multiple different platforms, multiple different like uh, systems for the end user. So I think that distinction is a great point, Chris. There's something else too. Like this was years ago. I was working with like a very big artist, like major artist, and his manager was there and said. I want to play the album on my laptop now. And I was like, why? And he's like, because people listen on laptops. And I was like, all right. I gave him a flash drive. He sat in my studio listening on a laptop and he said it needs more bass. And I was like, I knew you were going to say that because there are no bass speakers on a laptop. A laptop is also a computer. It's not a stereo system or playback system or whatever. Yes, you can listen to music on it, but it is not designed to listen to music. It is something you can listen to other things on there. You can listen to podcasts on there. You can listen to videos on there. You can listen to a whole bunch of things. People talking, you can listen to your, you know, like typing stuff, but it's not a playback system. 
So I had to convince him that by adding base for the laptop, I would screw up everything else. And one of the problems I find today is that a lot of people are listening and mixing on headphones. Mm -hmm. And while it might be good in some aspects, it's probably the most terrible thing that you could do because you have no control over shaping your low, low end. And I've done records where people said, oh, I mixed it on headphones and it comes in here and I'm listening to 30 hertz out of control or, you know, like 40 hertz completely out of just like, woo, woo, you know, and they don't hear that in the headphones or their earbuds or their laptop. So they don't know it's there, but it's filling in a void in their mix that sounds good on the headphones. But when I play it here, it sounds bad. So I take it out and then in the head, they're listening again in the headphones and like, it doesn't sound right. And I'm like, you need to find a yeah. balance. You, there right. has to be a balance right? because without it being balanced, it's going to sound like shit on one system and good on another. And that's not what you want. You want something to sound good on every system. Right. And that's the trick. And that's, I mean, that's the game. And that's why, uh, you know, you can spend decades doing this and why people come to you for that and put that much faith in you as the guy that's going to run that baton across the finish line, right? You don't, you don't put like the worst man in that position for a relay race. You put your dead sprinter, you put your ace there, you know, for that exact reason. Um, and Chris, I, you've given us and I'm sure everybody listening a ton to think about and a ton to settle in on in terms of treating different projects and, and how what you do in your process, you know, can vary a lot. But at the end of the day, the, you know, the ideology is, is kind of always the same. And it's just that to get whatever you put out to translate and sound good on as many things as possible. Something other people don't, I, I just want to throw this in there. A lot of times people say, oh, my mixer is going to master it. And if you mix something and you end there and then send it to mastering, it's different than if you were say, okay, I'm going to go to here, I'm done mixing, and now I'm going to master it by turning it up and doing this stuff. It's almost the same person is doing it, so they're not. there's no critical listening to it. In their mind, it's done. So their critical listening and their judgment of it is not going to be what you want in the end. You want someone who's going to listen to it and say, this needs this, this needs this, I'm basing it on this system and I'm basing it on a cumulative listen of like all parts, all mixes, different stuff. So if like each mixer on a little Nas X record mastered their versions, it would be completely all over the place because yeah. each one of them thinks their song's done when they're done mixing. And then they're only doing something else to enhance that in the end where I'm listening to it and saying, this song needs to be way brighter. This song needs this, this need, song needs to come up. This song needs to come down and put it together as a project. And it's what I do is a third, it's a third person's view of a creative project. Like you guys did all this stuff. And now I'm saying, this is my opinion. I've done this for decades. I have a great system, a system that I can trust. You know, I trust myself. I feel confident in my decisions. And this is my opinion. And people, are second guessing that now because they're like, oh, I can just do it with a plugin. There's a mastering plugin. And I'm like, you're missing the point. Like mm -hmm. you're literally missing the point of what mastering is and why I do what I do. It's to bring it all together and like change things that you missed because you're so connected to it and are afraid to admit or change because it sounds good in your studio alone. Yeah. yeah. And to do it all in a musical way, you know what I mean? Yes. Um, a, a way that's keeping that intent of at the end of the day, you are a music lover sitting there making sure that music moves you in, in a spot that you know and trust. So I, I love that. Absolutely. No, the movement, the feeling, all that stuff is so important to me. That's like that's what got me sitting here. Yeah. yeah. was as a kid listening to music and being like, oh, man, I feel that. Like it wasn't just music playing, like it hit me emotionally, it hit me feeling wise, it did everything to me, it gave me goosebumps, it inspired me to want to do this stuff. That's that's the feeling that I still try and put in everybody's record yes. 40 years later. Amazing. A fan before everything else. I love that. That's a, that's, I, I think um, we're all still here because we've managed to, against many odds, 
continue to find a way to wake up and be a fan of music first and foremost. Chris, this has been awesome. I can't thank you enough for being very gracious with your time. I'm sure you could have mastered like seven incredible like Grammy award winning records in this time. So I know it's precious, but Tom and I are really, really happy that you uh, that you came back and joined us. And we have a, a very robust gear candy um, for people to check out. So stay tuned for that as well in, in the coming weeks and or months of the show but thank you again chris garinger sterling sound thank you guys it was great thanks chris where can everybody find you obviously we'll link to it in the show notes but real quick your website and and everything you do at sterling yes sterlingsound.com is our website um you can find me on instagram i'm always on there screwing around you know i'll promote your music if i love it you know even if i don't love it i promote everybody i work with Amazing. Amazing. I'm here all the time. <laughs> well, very good. You heard it. Go check out the re- I mean, the discography is just nutty. Uh, yeah, it's mind-boggling, <laughs> um, dude. So go, yeah, go um, find that link in the show notes and and look through it. I'm sure you will recognize more records than just the three that we talked about. So, Chris, thank you very much, buddy. Enjoy the rest of your day. We will catch up with you very soon, I hope. All right. Thanks, guys. Really had fun. You know, it's so refreshing to speak with a professional that knows themselves and their role in the process so well. Chris is an amazing example of a mastering engineer that has developed and refined a confidence and an intuition in his approach over the years. Simply put, he bases his decisions around the guiding philosophy of do right by the song. And in order to believe you are capable of doing that, you must first believe your own hype, as Chris says. You must be able to tell yourself that you're the best at what you do and the way you do it. And even more telling was Chris's comment that the best engineers and artists are always open to opinion. Once again, we see this idea of openness and the surrendering of ego in order to continue pushing our knowledge and work forward. And as creators, I think it's only natural that our confidence will wax and wane in the heat of our work. Even veterans with years of validating awards and successes like Chris will question their own work from time to time. But I think it can be valuable to carry this skepticism with you. A healthy dose of skepticism that can be used as a tool to awaken the curiosity necessary to continue evolving. So here's some questions I propose we take away from this. What guiding philosophies are serving you right now? And how are you investing in your own curiosities? And finally, what dividends might a healthy dose of skepticism yield for you in the work that has yet to take shape? Give it some thought, and we'll catch you back here next week on The Record Process.